All right, should we get started? Yeah? Let me hear that. Should we get started? Uh, okay, all right. Well, thanks for coming up, uh, coming over for the AV Talks series, uh, this time in Seattle, hosted by Statsik. Today, the topic is Founders by Founders. Um, this is a small stage. And yet, we have three founders crowded here, three amazing local founders here. So now, show of hands, how many of you are in a startup or thinking about starting a startup? Oh, wow. OK, this is amazing. For Seattle, this is amazing. I'm really, <laughs> the trend is good. This is a good trend. So I'm really happy to see everyone here. And so um, hopefully, you'll all get a chance to ask questions to these founders there. They've been through the trenches of starting a company and running very successful companies here. Um, and I'll, I'll give an intro quickly. But before that, I want to thank the organizers. Um, organizers, the team from Statsig, uh, specifically Morgan and EG, who have been here all day setting things up and making sure that this is a, a very, very good and successful event. Could we all give a round of applause for them? Thank you. All right, I have with me here um, some outstanding founders. Um, I'll start from the left. We have Linda Lian, who is the founder and CEO of Common Room. Hi, everyone. We have Jared Roche, founder and CTO of Octo AI. Hello. And we have Justin Uberti, founder and CTO of Fixie.ai. Hello, everyone. Okay, so um, I'm gonna start this off with a very simple question. We'll let them off easy for, for, for now. Um, Linda, a uh, question for you first. So uh, tell us a bit about your company and a fun fact about you or your company. Oh, wow, okay. I'll start with the easy part first. Um, we're called Common Room and we build a customer intelligence platform. What that means is we aggregate every single observable piece of buyer intent um, things like website visits, who's hitting your free trial with their Gmail, we're the best in the world at de-anonymizing GitHub repos and who's engaging with you in those. And we use that um, plus our AI-powered uh, enrichment waterfall to figure out who you are and where you work. Um, and we're leveraged by DevRel teams, community teams, SDR teams, sales teams at hundreds of the fastest growing SaaS companies out there from OpenAI to um, Databricks uh, to MongoDB, NVIDIA. Uh, so if you're thinking about building a developer tooling company, definitely come talk to us. I think uh, that's probably a, a huge set of our customer base today. Awesome, Jared. Yeah, oh, I turn it back on. Um, yeah, so at Octo AI, we kind of have a whining journey where our beginnings were at UW, actually. Uh, me and my four of my co-founders were all UW PhDs, or Luis, my co-founder and CEO, was a professor there. And about seven years ago, we were really obsessed with machine learning, deep learning inference becoming a big thing everywhere. And that was sort of our founding goal, was like, this is gonna become a big challenge, how do we optimize it? Uh, we've gone through sort of phases where I think pre-chat GPT, a lot of this was by engaging with big companies uh, who were building custom models, because the number of people building customer model, custom models were very low in that world. And I think in the sort of post-GPT world, we see people who are you know, building, say, with OpenAI today, and they want to move to a custom model, and they see the drop-off being sort of this small step. But to actually get that thing to be performant and accurate uh, and flexible for your use case, uh, and most importantly, cost-effective, they actually need a lot of software and systems building that goes into that that requires expertise from the kernel level all the way to you know, how it's served up to you as a web API. Uh, and that's what we've been building the last few years. And we sort of the two key verticals we have right now are sort of image animation, we have people building creative apps and things like that on top of it. Even I was saying to someone uh, a moment ago while we were having drinks that we have like pop sockets as a customer, which is very bizarre to me because four years ago, I would not imagined uh, someone who builds things that go on your phone as a customer of the optimization technology we had. And then, you know, on the other side, we have a lot of people doing LLMs either for virtual assistants or uh, business intelligence or, you know, enrichment of data or a variety of these cases. And a lot of that is about model customization. And that's something we've been really obsessed about the last few years. Oh, I forgot a fun fact, and so did you. Should we do that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> well, fun fact about me is I can lick my elbow. Go on. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Find me after, I'll show you. <laughs> My fun fact, or funny to me, is I once worked so hard on a research paper that I lost in Oregon. I'll explain the story if you want to know later. It, it's a non-important Oregon, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll come find you. <laughs> All right, Justin, tell me your story and then fun fact. Uh, yeah, so at Fixie AI, we've been around for almost two years now, and we've uh, sort of described ourselves as BC before ChatGPT, which means that we kind of thought this was an interesting space, and then all of a sudden it got super crazy all of a sudden. <laughs> uh, and what we focus on is real-time AI. And, and what that typically means is the ability for to build models that can natively understand speech and video and then generate that as well. And so we kind of feel like today's language models are stuck in the command line era where they're, you have to type in the magic string and then you get back some text. And to really cross the chasm, we need to go and interact with people the way they do naturally with like speech. Uh, and it seems our friends at OpenAI have come to the same conclusion that uh, they're now rolling out you know, GPT-40 and the new voice mode in, in, in chat GPT. But you know, uh, ours is open source. And so we have an open source speech model and a platform that we are wrapping around that to allow people to build like, amazing speech experiences that are built around a, a fast speech LLM. So uh, that's what we're doing at Fix the AI. Um, and my fun fact is that uh, within my family, we decided to make the startup thing a, a family affair that my son, uh, who actually worked at Octo AI, uh, is also a CEO of his own AI startup, uh, Edge.ai. I love that. That's awesome. All right. Um, lots of uh, uh, startup founders here and uh, people that want to start a company as well. So. I want to talk a little bit about the founder journey. So, you know, uh, let's start with Justin. What did you do before starting your company? And then what made you start the company? Why? Why? Are you crazy? So uh, I just left Google, you know, recently. I had been at Google for 15 years where I, I kind of led development of things like, you know, Google Duo and WebRTC. And uh, I, I was uh, kind of thinking, like, trying to think of what should I do next? And I, I said I was going to take some time to just go think about like what, what kind of things were out there, and I was talking to a few companies and everything. And then I had I, I talked to some people. Um, I actually got a chance to talk to Ashish Vaswani, one of the authors of the Transformer paper, and uh, also like Mustafa Suleiman from from DeepMind. And they showed me what they were working on, and I could not believe what I was seeing. Like they showed me some demos with GPT-3, and here was like a com computer that was like generating text that was answering the questions I was typing in, and I instantaneously, like everything I was, else I was thinking about for the next job went out the window. I was like, this is definitely like the, the, the path I want to go on. Um, I didn't know anything about deep learning, like other than doing a Google boot camp. I, I didn't really know anything else about like what it would take to kind of do a startup, uh, having never have been in a big company for a long time. But it's like, okay, if, if there's ever a time to do something, like this is a platform shift, I can feel it, and now would be a great time to, to go start a company. I love it. Jared? Nice. Uh, yeah, I, I think ours is uh, deep learning related in the same way, but I think our moment was we were all PhD students, or, or the core of us were, and Luis was. And Luis didn't work in this thing called approximate computing, which is like, what if you have a computer where the answers are not quite right, which at the time sounded really dumb. We were all like, man, there's no use case for this. It turns out like this is what people are doing with quantization and all these things today in machine learning. And Thierry, who my other co-founder is Luis's student, and Tian Chi, my other co-founder, like kind of had a conversation about it, and they're like, we should build a hardware accelerator for doing this. And that kind of kicked off that parallel thread. And I, at the same time, had been working on compilers, and I'd been working on this theorem prover uh, lean that was about formal verification. I was kind of burnt out on it, which ironically, this new um, result on the IOM, IOM uh, the Olympiad math challenge that Google presented this week is using lean, which is like a fun fact for me to connect back to my old life. But so I was like, I want to find a new project. And like one elevator conversation led to another. And I started talking to Chi. So the four of us started to work on, and TVM had already been built. So the TVM was this deep learning compiler. Because at the time, we saw the problem was like, you can't really run these models on a lot of stuff. So we kind of got to this point where we had a ResNet running on a Raspberry Pi, which at the time was cool. And I had watched my friend build YOLO, which is this very popular computer vision uh, library next to me in the lab. And I, I was like, deep learning is going to be a thing. And people need to build systems. And in a moment, a hubris is like, oh, they don't know what they're doing. It's going to be bad. I'm going to go work on this. And so I think two months into working on it, I was like, hey, guys, have we thought about doing a startup? And it turns out Luis was thinking the same thing. And so was I. And so for about a year, we had like these like uh, 
you know, clandestine lunches or whatever at the faculty club at UW where we were thinking about doing a startup. And that, we kind of build conviction that inference was gonna be this big problem. And I think the two kind of assumptions that we had was like the number of models or like the number of deployed models is gonna grow. The amount of inference people are gonna do is gonna grow. So there's an opportunity here because our biggest worry, which I think has been a consistent one, is like were we too early? And I was also kind of looking for my exit plan for my PhD or like what was I gonna do? And I was like, ah, well maybe I'll do this for a year and if not, I'll just go on the faculty market and become a professor or whatever. And one thing led to another and it's been five years. So that was kind of our, our journey. Um, you know, and I think for us, the, that part of the early founding was actually maybe easier than some people's journeys, but other parts have been harder uh, for sure. Linda. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think what's so incredible is how deeply personal and individualistic everyone's founder journey can be. Um, it's really cool to hear your guys' stories. But for me, um, yeah, I was always kind of a jack of all trades, master of nothing. I had a very kind of meandering, you know, lackluster career if you were to look at it on paper. <laughs> I um, joined investment banking at Morgan Stanley out of school doing mergers and acquisitions. So really huge cross-border M&A deals and legacy in, uh, industries like consumer goods. Um, decided that, you know, I wanted to kind of check out this startup thing ended up interviewing at two companies. One was uh, Lookout Mobile Security, which I'm sure you have no idea what that is <laughs> because they uh, weren't ultimately very successful. And the other one was a tiny 100-person startup in a garage uh, in, in San Francisco called Stripe. Um, and you know, I ended up choosing Lookout. And <laughs> I think about that decision all the time. Um, and then, and so, you know, to my point about being quite mediocre, um, after that, I decided, you know, I was in FP&A, so finance and kind of accounting. Um, I decided, which, you know, I had never been good at math, so why was I even doing this? I don't know. Um, ended up moving back home to Seattle, which is where I'm from. Uh, sent a cold email to, you know, the only financial looking place in Seattle, which was Madrona Venture Group. Uh, ended up getting a job there as an investor and partnering with, uh, you know, Soma, who's on our board today. And it was really there that I became incredibly passionate about developer tools, open source as a distribution model. We ended up doing the Series C and Snowflake, a ton of incredible uh, DevOps tools that was really the renaissance at the time. Um, and I wanted to kind of, you know, go where the action was happening because I had learned so much about dev tools. Uh, so went to AWS, led a uh, go-to-market strategy for serverless and containers, which at the time was very nascent. I think, um, you know, we launched AWS Lambda, uh, EKS, Fargate, um, ECS, and so, you know, I think that was really an incredibly formative experience for me. Why did I leave AWS to start something? The truthful answer is I didn't have a light bulb idea. It didn't strike me from the heavens. I decided that I wanted to be a founder and I felt like I was ready. Um, and so it was a very purposeful exercise for me to sit down and say, I wanna start a company. I think I understand, broadly speaking, how products get built, how, how customer value is created, how businesses build value. Let me go and do some discovery. And so interviewed a lot of people, went through a thousand ideas. I remember sitting in Madrona's office telling Soma, you know, what about like a social forum for pets? Like literally. <laughs> I went through like a productivity note-taking app idea. Everybody has that idea. If, you, if that's your idea right now, keep going. <laughs> um, but it took some time. And you know, even when we started Common Room, it was really a DevRel tool and a community tool. And over the last four years, again, really orienting around, you know, customer centricity and customer value. Um, we've evolved a ton, and um, I think, you know, for me, the essence of my founder journey has been, um, you know, going where I felt energized, doing things that, you know, I wanted to do, and then ultimately listening to the customer and having no pretense or ego about what this thing was supposed to be. It's really cool to hear each person's story is so different and how very individual it is. And it actually resonates with me as well because for me, um, I did 10 years at Microsoft and then I spent 10 years at Facebook and then for me, it was like a life journey 
where I decided, okay, well, the next thing I want to do is something very dif different, drastically um, different from what I've done in the past. And so then I founded Statsy, kind of like um, the idea of founding the company came first and then the idea of what to build came next. Um, okay, so at least in my experience, after I decided to found the company and then like, you know, set up the company and like, you know, hiring and all of that, it, it was a chaotic process. And, um, and I want you to describe that chaotic process. I'm pretty sure you all remember those first few days of like, or first few months really, um, of like setting up a company, try to understand how to run it. And so please describe that. Um, Jared, you go first. Okay, sounds good. Uh, so it's actually funny because last week was our, officially our fifth birthday. Like we incorporated exactly five years ago. So Congratulations. it was like the middle of the summer. Uh, I remember we like went to the, like talking about the chaos starting early. I, my friend was in town who actually ended up joining Octo for a while. Uh, and we were like walking around and we were still arguing about what to name the company. And we had a lawyer appointment in like four hours. So we like get in the elevator. Uh, we ended up working 1201 third, which is the pyramid building downtown. We get in there to go to, to Perkins, which is our lawyer, and we're on the way up, and we're arguing in the elevator still about it, and we like come to conclusion about the name, why we're in the elevator, and we get out, and like there's this beautiful panoramic view of, of the sound and everything, it's beautiful. We sit down, and like we then are like, hey, we want to change the name, and they've like spent all this time, you know, some paralegal has like done, prepared all the paperwork, and we had to like do it all over again. So instead, we went for this very anticlimactic like signature moment. It didn't really happen. We like got DocuSigns the next day or whatever, and it was like the chaos started in that moment. Uh, and then I think we had like an off-site, you know, we went and talked it through the company and like how we're going to hire. And I think those first like five months, because this is like six months before COVID, like those first five or six months, it's like we got a WeWork in the same building actually, and we were like crammed in this little like hallway size, uh, you know, place. There were like eight of us or something. We hired a couple people from UW. I remember Luis's like administrative assistant uh, at UW, who's like the grant administrator, came on board and it was like, oh, Amanda's gonna come with us for 10 hours a week. It was not 10 hours a week and she's now our VP of people. Uh, and so it became a much longer journey. And so there was like a couple of those first early months where it was like really just us, like I remember we were in Madrona's office, actually it was our first real office. Like they have some floater desks that they gave us. And we were there for like maybe two months or something and we needed to move down the street and so us and our one intern and uh, like took the monitors and carried them down Third Avenue and like you know it probably is an OSHA violation as I'm saying it but uh, we you know did that whole move and it was like I was building the desks I remember we got in an argument because Terry and I were trying to find the right size desk for the office for everyone and we bought a too big one and Luis is like you spent too much money and I'm like Luis this is not a good use of my t you know like we're like arguing about it but there's like those chaotic moments where like when you zoom back out you're like why were we did we care about those things like the two hundred dollars was not the you know the big big challenge but I think a lot of it is just that there's so much just actual setup that you have to do in those first few months like I was the IT guy I think for at least nine months where like I was like the people would lock themselves out of their email or whatever and I'd have to like send the single sign on reset code um, and you don't really know that you're signing up for a lot of those things or maybe you do if you're a repeat founder but I think I'd even been at startups so I didn't realize like how much just like extra work there would be involved in it um, and then also you know I joked to someone also earlier this was my first real job like I've interned and I worked at a couple startups but it was like this is the first time I've been like real nine to five forever and like we had to figure out how to interview people. Like I think in the beginning our interviews were not very good. Like we like had to figure out and bootstrap that entire process and we we're very academic. So like we were having people give like job talks at some point, which was cool in some ways and some of our early culture, but there's a whole period of figuring those things out and there's a million of those tiny fragments that were hard. So hopefully that adds a little color, but. Yeah, I mean, to that point, I remember stopping by Pulumi's office and Eric Rudder was under the table trying to hook up the Wi-Fi. <laughs> Um, he's, I don't know, number two at Microsoft for many years. Um, startup life uh, takes no prisoners. <laughs> I think um, it's all about finding collaborators and like your people in the beginning. And that's like number one. Um, if you're not gonna be able to get the team together, right, the right mix of those people, um, it's gonna be really hard to get it off the ground. And to your point, you know, I, I remember in the early days just Number one, like, got to get the team together, have to figure out how to hire, who do we need first. You know, I decided I'm a business person, right? I'm more sales and marketing oriented, and, you know, I'm okay at product, but I needed a designer. So 
how do I recruit a designer? Because then we can get in front of customers, we can start to show mocks, we can start to have conversations to find product market fit. And so you're always kind of like, what's the minimal viable team? And it's so important to find just incredible people that you connect with from a values perspective, from a you know, ethos perspective, from a vibes and like personal chemistry perspective. I think a lot of people who are kind of in that you know, founder or initial team hunting mode, you can discount that, but it's so critical in the beginning. Um, and so definitely remember the heady days of just, you know, pounding the pavement, so to speak, and trying to get that initial team together um, because you can't do anything alone. I think the second learning for me that really stands out is the fundraising game. <laughs> it's very different than what you would expect even though I had been an investor, being on the other side of the table, I was like, oh my gosh. Um, and so you just learn a lot of lessons very, very quickly. And I think one of the biggest lessons in fundraising that I learned is um, you kind of have to tell the story people want to hear. <laughs> um, and you will iterate to that at some point. But yeah, there's definitely like a, a sales process to it. It's, it's kind of like selling. How many of you here are fundraising right now? All right, a few hands. Take, take, take notes. <laughs> I'll just maybe add on to that a little bit. I get, the importance of the team is so critical. The, uh, a lot of the, the IT stuff you can get as a SaaS now. And so like day one, up and running in Google Cloud, we have workspace, uh, you know, we, we've got a bunch of other things, one password, like no, nothing like, like that was the challenge, except for hiring, because I think like that greenhouse or at level, like all these tools are made for like 500,000 person startups, like there's nothing for like, you are four people trying to get your company off the ground. So just like that, that, that like I think we're all like suffer with the, the hiring thing. But um, you know, the, 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 the getting the team, we had four co-founders and uh, I'll, I'll just, say that without any further comment, uh, but I'll, I'll give that two, two uh, illustrative examples. Uh, and, and one was like, we were trying to figure out what we we're gonna start by, um, you know, uh, what was our first thing we were gonna go pursue? And uh, so we went out to this cabin in the woods uh, where we thought we'd have this little offsite and we'd talk about product and that sort of thing. And uh, you know, some of us hadn't even met each other and uh, I, one of the things I, I was thinking about was like, you know, cause I, I'd seen like some demos from these other people, I was like, I think we should make a chatbot. And this was the summer of 2022, before ChatGPT or anything. I, was like, I think we should make a chatbot. I, I think that might be like, like the technology the stuff is, uh, is really suited for. And, and one of the other co-founders like, just got extremely angry. He was like, we're not making a chatbot because I think they're stupid. And uh, I was like, oh, OK. Uh, th this is going to be an interesting thing to try to get all on, on the same page of, of, of where we're going. Um, and and, and like, we, we actually did a good, probably a good job of trying to average of like, you know, and try to be like, we all came from Google, try to be Googly about how, uh, you know, uh, let, letting other people kind of like, you know, have like, you know, some wins and stuff like that and trying to basically have like a good culture of just people kind of trying to support each other and everything. But it's very hard to have a great product when you're trying to basically do it by committee and, and average things. And so one of the places that it really came out was in our logo where we go to these designers and like four people have four totally different ideas about what the logo should look like. And so it's like that sketch where it's like, can you make seven lines and have all of them perpendicular and three of them have to be transparent and green? And uh, the designer's like, ah, uh, what do I do with this? So anyway, I, I, the founding team, I, I, the, the most important thing you can spend time on is just getting your founding team kind of aligned directly. It'll make the most enormous difference. And values is what you're yes. talking about. Like, are we a googly culture? Or are we not, right? What are our values? I think, yeah, it's like a marriage, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we had five, which is uh, like maybe inadvisable, like uh, just because it's like it's it's a five way, you know, it's five paired relationships each way. So you have like twenty five interaction points, and it's like I think to your point before you really even if the, someone's a CEO or whatever, the relationships are not that defined yet. So you do have to like figure out how you negotiate things, and I think we were relatively well aligned in some of those values, but I think it, when it came time to having a dictator on something, which you need sometimes, it like, that was where we also struggled, I think, in the beginning, and it took us a couple attempts to figure out how to like, be like, this person is gonna go do this one thing uh, with like, real clarity about it. That's great. I, um, I could totally relate to this, because um, I remember um, we started during the middle of the uh, pandemic, and 
we were all like masked up in the office and I remember there um, the employees used to make fun of like our Wi-Fi situation they used to hang a poster that said um, last Wi-Fi uh, outage since zero days and it never <laughs> went past zero days and I was the IT guy so as you can imagine those were really fun days <laughs> we still have problems um, other kinds of problems um, all right so uh, you all touched a little bit on hiring and uh, I think hiring is extremely important for especially the early early days who you hire can really make or break the startup so tell me uh, you know how did you decide who to hire how did you go about hiring this person? Linda, you start first. Yeah, I think for us, it came back to values. So from a technology perspective, we always had the philosophy that the tech was uh, the means to an end, and that end was customer value. And so when we hired for even our first 10 engineers, we cared about a strong tenant around, hey, we're gonna use boring technology here. <laughs> We're gonna use tech that's really well supported. We're not going to try to reinvent the wheel. So if you're an engineer who you know, really likes to use nascent technologies and kind of push the boundaries, that's not our culture here from an engineering perspective. Um, you know, the areas where we did push the boundaries was all in service of developer productivity. It was uh, you know, using TypeScript or Type GraphQL, lining front end and back end languages, using Pulumi, so infrastructure as code, adopting SASIG, um, you know, not doing any different, uh, undifferentiated heavy lifting. Um, and all of that was in service of product velocity and finding customer value. And so for us, like, we had to find engineers that fit that philosophy. And a lot of engineers want to go to early stage startups to get their hands on really cool tech. And that just wasn't you know, part of our mandate or our values. Um, and so we designed a hiring process that really rigorously tested for pragmatism, <laughs> making the right decisions on things like velocity and customer value. And um, you know, I think that's very much still our culture today and incredibly, uh, you know, our, the tech stack that we started out with has never changed. Of course, we've increased our usage and increased, you know, the, the functionality that we leverage, but it's been, you know, I would say we're, we're kind of boring in that, in that sense. <laughs> I actually think that's a really, really important point you're making because innovation energy is limited, and so you want to use that energy in the areas you want your startup to differentiate, not in the undifferentiated spaces. Uh, well put. Yeah, I think we did like the exact opposite. Uh, not, not necessarily correctly either. Uh, I think because we came from building a piece of deep technology in a part of the market that's not very well defined, I think it's we started with like a very clear how, and that actually had a very like warping, almost like a gravity eff lensing effect on the what and the why we were doing things. And I think it took us like a fair amount of time to like overcome that actually. And I think for that, like our early hiring was really about like hiring for, I'm gonna use the word religion, but like really religion, it was like people who wanted to build things in the way that we wanted to build them, and we were still doing open source, I mean we still are, but we were doing open source like very actively from like a direct continuation from our, our time in academia, and so I think that that really created a strong like biasing effect, some ways good and some ways bad. Like I think we got a lot of really smart people, but then we were, to your point, we, we were spending our innovation budget on things that actually like, if we won the battle, like we'd lose the war kind of uh, uh, moments so where it's like, we are fighting like, for example, at some point with ARM, who is in our open source community, about like how to architect part of the compiler, and we spent a bunch of energy there. And I think that like, those are things that I think were negative outcomes of doing that. Um, I think that like in retrospect, I think the hiring advice is more company building advice more than anything, which is that like, I think no matter where you're coming from and what you want to build, like you need to start with a blank slate and really work to define like why you're doing the thing before you do anything else. And that doesn't mean you can't pull from the things that you build, but I, I think that that like had such a strong effect on the product that we build, the way we talk to customers. And I, I think even like the market segment we went after, like in the beginning, we spent a lot of time on these like larger enterprises and that even changed then, like it further had an influencing effect on who we hired and like on the sales side and how we thought about it. And then it took, you know, months or years to undo some of those things when we decided it wasn't the right way to do things. So I think that that, 
it's really like people say it, but I think just internalizing that like the embryonic structure of the company you lay down really will come to maturity at some point, and you have to be very like thoughtful about laying that down. And you'll probably still make mistakes, like we all do. But I, I think it's like in retrospect that that the missing clear why, uh, and part of it because the market's not defined. But like I think that that really hurt us in the hiring process and like how we conceptualize it. Yeah, we, we hired from our network, uh, you know, just, just to get things off the ground, and we really selected for, for cognitive capability because we knew that we didn't know exactly where the market, this AI thing was going to take, was, what direction it was going to go, but we wanted people who would be really versatile and like we didn't necessarily know what skills would be critical, just the ability to think. And I told each one of our founding engineers, we see you not just as employees, but we see you as the future leaders of our company. And we're, select, we're, we're, we're basically trying to hire you because that's what the capability and the potential that we see in you because like, as we grow, you're gonna be the people who are gonna be like, ready to scale up and run teams. And, and selecting for that, I, I think, really helped us get, get going. I think um, one undertone that I heard in all of the hiring conversation is the culture, the value system that you all talked about. So. Um, Tell me a little bit about your value system. How did you decide what matters to your company and what is it that you're gonna hold? And if you can also talk a little bit about how it's evolved since. Um, Justin, you start. Okay, uh, I didn't have the luxury of being able to think about my answer. But uh, I, 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 I think, uh, you know, I mentioned we, we sort of hired for, for cognitive capability and, and that, you know, we, we, we sort of said that we're gonna be uh, a sort of vision first, you know, company. We're gonna paint an audacious audacious uh, technical vision, and we, we, we find that's the kind of thing, A, that's good for hiring, because people get excited about working on interesting technical problems, uh, and then that kind of also helps define the, the culture of the company of, of like, oh, like the, you know, these are, the, the, people are gonna work hard on these things, and, and we'll try to do some things that, that maybe uh, other people aren't doing because, uh, you know, it requires more expertise or, or, or more, more investment. Um, and, and I think that that's largely what we've been able to achieve is, is that you know, we've been trying to solve uh, you know, interesting problems at the model layers that, that, that people aren't tackling, but you need to really throw yourself at it and dig in in order to, to un understand this. Uh, and and you know, I think that people have been very, our, our employees of all, you know, who have been, our founding engineers are all still with us, uh, have been very excited about these things. Yeah, I think on the value side, <clears throat> we, I mean, we've done some of the very corporate values exercises a couple times. Uh, and I think some of them are still there. I think we actually were very similar to, uh, to what Justin's talking about, where it's, we were very focused on like sort of flexibility, cognitive capability, ability to think big, because things were so undefined. I think that part has stayed with us. I think we have like a very like deeply technical culture that has like stayed with us. I think where we've grown maybe a little bit more is, I think we were more focused on being nice in the beginning, and we are like a very empathetic uh, group of people, like even the founding team, like one of our investors at Amplify once made fun of, they were all too nice. Uh, she's like, maybe it's people from Seattle. Uh, I told her I was from LA, not Seattle, but uh, you know, to mess with her because I think I had to sometimes be more like the hard line on a few things because we were really more nice than kind. And I think we've grown in that way where we've really prioritized more being like the accuracy and the honesty and having some of those hard conversations like in the company culture. And I think with that has been nurtured like a customer obsession that did not exist in the beginning where like now even our most hardcore like ML PhDs who were joined us for the open source in the beginning are like really excited about how they can drive and affect customer output. Like for example, we shipped this LoRa feature for models for people who know about it and like one of our core engineers has like made improvement after improvement to bring down the latency for customers who are not using LoRa as one of these multi-tenant environments and it's a super customer driven thing and I don't, we did not have that in the beginning and I think that really has come out in us and more like a product culture. I think that's where our values have grown the most but I think the other good parts we've kind of kept uh, and I think that there's a good foundation in there, for sure. Wow, I have so many thoughts on this. Um, so I'm from AWS, where there's 13 leadership principles, <laughs> and sometimes you kind of felt like you were working for the values instead of the values were working for you. It's like, dang, like I don't want to be called out for not being, you know, biased for action enough. <laughs> Um, and so I think, you know, while I recognize the power of values deeply, actually, because Amazon's incredible about values. I also wanted to kind of keep it simple. Um, and then simultaneously, one of our earliest investors was Jeff Weiner, who um, you know, was the CEO and now executive chairman of LinkedIn. And uh, you know, there's a framework that uh, helped LinkedIn scale from seed to uh, the 
multi-billion dollar corporation it is today, and it's a framework called Vision to Values. And he kind of drilled it into me because I was very resistant in the beginning. I was like, ah, I need to go, you know, do cool things, like hook up the Wi-Fi, like not trying to like create a vision to values doc. And he was like, you have to sit down and do this because your vision is going to be like the reason why people are going to leave their high paying jobs at Fang whatever and join your rinky dink startup. And your vision needs to be something that's not gonna change for the next 20 years or the entirety of this co company's like life. And he helped me iterate on what that would mean because it needed to be durable. Um, and what we aligned on was, you know, Common Room's vision is to transform how organizations engage with people. It's very simple, it's our guiding North Star. And trust me, over the last four and a half years, we've been through some evolutions. And by evolutions, I mean pivots. And what has not changed through all of these evolutions in our product mar market fit journey has been that vision. To this day, we work on behalf of organizations and we want to transform how they engage with people, whether it's through DevRel and community or their you know, outbound SDR and AE teams. Um, and so that has been just so powerful. And when we did have to pivot, we could refer back to our vision and we could say, hey, we're not going to be precious about anything here because we believe that the market has changed and we need to kind of pivot. But our vision is exactly the same. So could not like endorse Jeff's vision to values framework more. <laughs> it's helped me guide the company through rough and choppy waters and really help the entire organization have something to hold on to. Um, there's all these other pieces of the framework like mission and strategy. So I encourage you to look it up. It's called vision to values. Um, but we also set our values from the start and you know, maybe I was a little allergic to the 13 leadership principles, but we wanted to start with just four because I think what's really critical about values is that you can indoctrinate them into the thinking of your organization. So how are you making decisions, right? Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of ambiguous things where, you know, everybody has an opinion. Well, can you anchor that in your core values? And I think what I love also about values is that it gives everybody a voice, right? Whether you're an intern or you're the CEO, when you speak in the language of your company's values, you have a leg to stand on. And so we only have four. It's custom, be customer centric, customer obsession is our number one value. We orient everything from the lens of, you know, our customer's experience and the value they're getting. The second one is bias for simplicity. We have a lot of really smart people on the team. Smart people like to think for the sake of thinking. They like to solve problems for the sake of Rubik's cubes. And we ain't got no time for that, right? <laughs> and so bias for simplicity pulls people out of, you know, getting too far down the rabbit hole. Um, the third one is make it happen. It's a startup. You know, high ownership. Nobody else is going to do it. You've got to go and make it happen. And then our fourth one is we're all in this together. Um, and I would say, you know, as we're scaling up go to market, that's been an incredible value to align the organization on because our North Star metric is ARR, it's revenue, and that's not a sales thing. I mean, I think that's a huge misconception, right? Um, something like ARR is a we're all in this together thing. The best sales team in the world can't sell a product without product market fit. Your CS team can't make a customer successful if your sales team rolled, sold the wrong use case. Um, your marketing team, right, needs to do their job. And so um, our last value is we're all in this together. And as we've scaled up, it's been really awesome. I think on the being together, it's like yesterday there was a customer issue. I realized like, I could fix it in like three minutes. I sent a pull request. And like, I don't know if we deployed it yet, but it was merged <laughs> in the next hour. You know, it's like, and I think that's the kind of thing where also when you act them as well, it helps. It's like, hey, if there's a customer problem, find it, fix, fix it, and then move forward. And I think that kind of intensity, like, you know, as much as people hate Elon, the like sleeping on the factory floor thing, I think has some value in it where like, you know, if you're in it with everyone, people see that whether you're on sales or marketing or engineering. I love that. I think that's pretty awesome. Um, I, I, we have the same kind of uh, thinking as well. Like we have four values at Statsig only because we can't have everyone remember 13. It's just going to be. <laughs> Hard to we'll have 13 one day. Yeah. That's the ultimate <laughs> success date. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep adding. All right. Um, I want to turn the uh, questions to the audience. So we have um, 
uh, these founders, they, you know, uh, ready to share their immense experience. So feel free to ask questions. Hey, hi. Uh, my name is Anand. Thank you so much for sharing your journey, uh, your values, and also things to watch out for. Uh, could you also share some things that were super successful, some ideas that were maybe not so obvious, not so intuitive at the start, but worked very well? Do you have one? Uh, I don't know. Do you know? Uh, you look like you're ready. I'm thinking uh, for a second. Uh, do you have like an, a, a seed of like what kind of success, like to technical success, like like an organizational success? Uh, I think this might actually be obvious, but I, I think the, f the the value of focus is like extremely understated. Uh, I feel like I learned, I thought I learned this lesson during my PhD, but I didn't. Uh, I remember like Luis and I actually had a, one of our first arguments was about focus, like at our first offsite, or you know, our, I use argument in an academic sense, like we weren't yelling at each other. But like our first argument was like, oh, we can do a lot of things. I'm like, no, no, we can't, we can do one thing. And I feel like the one thing is like, what one thing is actually you have to continually refine that idea in your head. Because I think when you, you start off, there's so much creative energy. And I think killing things actually over time is Im the, the most successful thing that I've done at the company was like, I spent a year where I just narrowed what we were doing and it feels like it changed the company a lot. It was not very fun or easy, but like, I think that's like by far the best thing that you can do because you know, even if like, it's so noisy to measure if you're doing anything successful in the company. Like you can kind of tell if you're absolutely failing and then everything else is roughly the same that you want to reduce like what you're measuring as much as possible so that you can look at, because it might be like you're not getting good results because you're not doing a good job. It might be because your idea is wrong. And when you're trying to do that across 30 things and then kind of back to the values and the vision, like it, people end up like engineering things in the wrong direction where you're like people are executing against vision one, vision two, vision three, and the subtlety does not work very well when you're above like 20 people or even 10 probably so I, that would be my take uh, is be focused uh, was very successful yeah I, I can add to that a little bit and, and this is a, a bit of a surprise for us uh, as well not necessarily the focus but the uh, value of a focusing event uh, in that you're having a hackathon you're having a public demo you're having something where someone's gonna stand on stage and show off the product and they're gonna feel pretty stupid if like the thing doesn't work and I, I, I couldn't believe like how much output you know, the, how, how much the team would come together when everyone kind of had the same sort of feeling of like, we don't want to be responsible for like that person standing up on stage and, and, and looking stupid. And like, uh, even if like the, the, the overall sort of, there's a lot of blockers, a lot of things are unresolved, that clarified what was important and what was not essential. And, and so I, I think those sort of things of, you know, just having these, you know, almost arbitrary, um, you know, you need to go sell yourself as part of a startup, but like those can be very clarifying moments to really figure out what you should really push on. Focus is actually so hard. <laughs> um, in Frank Slootman's book, Amp It Up, uh, he talks about narrowing the focus. And, you know, I think it's just incredibly difficult, but then after you've done it, you're, you think back and you're like, wow, we were so unfocused. I mean, I feel like I go through this realization like every week. Um, I think tactically in the early days, one of the counterintuitive things is to ask people to pay for your product. <laughs> um, you know, I always felt like it wasn't mature enough, it wasn't fully featured enough, um, that you know, we weren't ready to ask for the money, but you actually get the most honest answer when you ask for their wallet. Because a lot of people will give you their time. They'll talk to you forever um, because you're building cool things. They want to give their opinion. And I think part of kind of that product market fit journey, assuming that you're kind of working towards it and you're not an overnight success, is actually finding out the truth. Um, and once you ask for money, that's when you know the truth. Uh, so I would ask for money early and often. I wish I did that. I was always a little scared. Um, but wow, the learnings and the acceleration that we had after, you know, I, I built up the courage to ask for money um, was just unparalleled compared to before when I was asking for people's time. Now the third milestone is to ask for their reputation. 
It's when you ask for a customer testimonial, a quote, their logo on your website. That's really, you know, they give you their time, they give you their wallet, they give you their reputation. And so how quickly can you get, you know, signal on each of those milestones, um, I think, is um, something that you know is a learning for me and something I wish I did uh, with more time compression. Uh, one thing, thanks for reminding me, is that um, I was a technical founder, um, so has done, I've done product and engineering in the past, and the thing that I did not do well is sales. And I would go talk to people, and I'll come back thinking like, oh my god, we have sold. <laughs> and then little did I realize that, oh yeah, that's just like, you know, like people promising time and stuff. And so uh, if you are a solo founder or a co-founder that does not have sales training, please go sell, uh, learn sales. Uh, very important. One other thing I'll just add is like, that's not obvious, is you can fire your customers that, uh, you know, one of the ways that you can end up being like a conglomeration of a lot of weird parts is by trying to do custom work for every single customer. And if, if it, you decide that like a certain customer like isn't really like where their head's not where you want to go, you, you can tell them no. And, and, and we've told like some pretty like large Fortune 100 companies like that, I, I don't think this is the right setup. And um, they've like, been very understanding, and a lot of times I've come back and said, well, what, what, what if we work with, like, you know, the, the direction you do want to go? And uh, I was like, oh, you can do that, you know? Like, it's, it's actually kind of non-intuitive. Yeah, I, I think just adding on those last ones, it's like, all of those things are like signifiers of commitment. And I think, you know, like, to be funny, it's like dating or something else. It's like commitment in relationships, a business relationship too, is like the actual signifier you're looking for. And getting to the commitment is really hard. And sometimes you, you're misaligned. Like, for example, someone might pay you one-time revenue and there's not really a recurring relationship there. Like, one challenge that we found was like, we like back to firing your customer or like getting out of a certain part of the business. Like we were like doing edge work and we were doing cloud work and like it touched all the things we just talked on, which was like exiting the edge business was actually extremely good for us along all these axes. Cause it was like, we stopped trying to bend to customers that we couldn't meet their needs. We like increased our focus and we got real commitment on the other side where we were like, kind of it was uncommitted before, so. All right, other questions? Hi, um, <clears throat> you guys came from Madrona, UW, Google, especially for UW. UW has all these systems that support startups, but at the same time, I, I believe all three of your organizations have, say, conflicts of interest. Um, what kind of hindrances have you experienced with uh, your prior organizations, uh, especially like on the academic side? if you were an employee at the UW? And then what kind of help did you get from your organizations? Uh, should I start? Uh, I, so I, I think we're in an exceptional circumstance. One, because everything we do is open source. Like if you're a bio PhD student, for example, the university patent office cares a lot more about what you're doing. You're likely gonna have to engage with them. Like for us, like we in theory did not need to do anything for the university because like we clean slate started the company. Uh, we did give some equity back to the department and the university is like a, uh, you know, like a make everything nice and clean and make sure everyone's happy with it because I think there had been some drama in the department about that past, but we didn't need to do that. So I think for me, there wasn't a lot of hindrance because like everything we had done as academics was in an open source Apache project. Like it was like, there was no overlap. So I think for some people you have to negotiate that. Like, I mean, the simple thing is you can do like a clean split where you buy a new computer and you do your work outside. And like in that case, as long as you're kind of clean and clear on what you did prior, you're, you're good and you read your IP agreements and things like that. But I did not find it to be too much of a hindrance like personally, like I, I think computer science is unique maybe in this one though like if you're in the hard sciences or uh you know chemistry or whatever like people then there's a lot more going on like there's this whole CRISPR suit that happened over like the gene editing tools because the universities all want to own that but like with us because we're building open source software there's no real patents like and the patents are not going to be super enforceable even if they got them uh, not very high value so the department or the university like patent office doesn't care as much I, I bought my own computer just so I wouldn't have any like, possible issues there, but I found that like, when I actually left my job, uh, it made an enormous difference in my ability to actually think uh, deeply about the, the, the future. And that I, I had been saying, like, I want to learn about how to do this deep learning stuff and everything, and like, it just didn't happen until when I woke up in the morning, that was the only thing to go do. 
Um, so I, you know, I was at a VC fund, and so it was very natural for me to go and talk to them and try to get them to fund me, and they were very, you know, open to that. I think um, my learning there is you got to go to the open market as well. <laughs> the reason why we ended up getting, you know, great terms and having a competitive process is exactly because um, I didn't, you know, just go with them. And so the second you become a founder, you know, you have to think that ultimately you're going to be wildly successful. You're going to have a ton of leverage. You know, you have to kind of affect that mindset. Um, and you have to make every single decision assuming that you're going to be wildly su successful. It's a huge, like, mental, uh, I think, cognitive dissonance. Because in the day to day, you're like, I'm nothing. Like, I'm so desperate for anyone, you know, to, like, fund me. Um, but I think that's actually when you start to get into situations where, um, you know, things start to not be favorable. Um, and so, yeah, that's another learning about fundraising if, uh, for the one person who's fundraising right now. I think there was offered, but I mean, so for perspective, like Luis, my co-founder, is also a venture partner at Madrona, which is like their due diligence role. So this is his third startup. I have done, I had worked at two. Like we all, like my other co-founder, TNG, like made XG Boost, which is like the probably the most impactful thing he's done. It was only one of the five things that he's done. So like we were in like a, uh, that's why I think our founding scenario is like very different where for a lot of people, the, the, the pain is sort of concentrated at the beginning. Uh, and I think like we have different problems because of that. But I think the early like raise money, it was also a different market. Like it was, you know, five years ago, like if you were like reasonably qualified and had a decent idea and we had a big open source project, it was like you can snap your fingers and raise money. It was like not really that hard. Um, like we had two VC firms pushing us to start the company. So I think it was like a different dynamic, uh, partly because like we patterned off of things like, you know, people had seen Spark and all these other like academic projects become successful. And so that was different for us. Like it's not gonna be true for everyone. Like I have some other academic friends who are trying to start a company right now and they're like trying to figure out if they do an SBIR, or, like take grant money or go through incubators. And so I think it also depends on what you're building too. Uh, so it's, I'm happy to talk more about it, but I think it's very personal. Like I, I don't feel like we got help beyond our network, which was just very good, which was helpful, but like it was like sort of the natural network effects. And uh, you know, as we all know, all this, is very network based and, and getting intros and stuff is huge. All right, we have time for one more question. That's unfortunate, I have two. Um, but the first question is going back to the point about hiring. I know Linda, you mentioned you were trying to convince people from Fang, what, and their high paying jobs, what did the pay structure for that first handful of employees look like? And then for the CTOs, what was an interesting challenge you ran into as a CTO that you didn't expect you would? Yeah, on the hiring front, um, you know, a lot of equity, <laughs> right? Um, in the beginning, you know, you have a maybe a seed or a pre-seed. There's maybe on a salary basis, you can get to a fourth <laughs> of some, someone's total take home from Fang. And so you really have to lean on, you know, again, like their passion about joining a founding team, having that journey with you, the problem space, the culture fit, right? The chemistry, do they want to do this incredibly hard thing with you? And then you have to convince them that their equity is going to be worth a lot. Uh, again, affecting that weird mindset of we're gonna be wildly successful. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the biggest learning there is there is a lot of incredible people out there who want to go to an early stage startup who like know that on their deathbed, if they hadn't done that, they would always regret it. And so we ended up getting incredible engineers from you know, Stripe, from Microsoft, because they were like, yeah, it's on my bucket list. Like, I wanna know what this is like. And you know, if I were to do it, I would do it now, and I would do it here. And that's kind of the like, logic you need to walk them through, right? Have you ever wanted to be at a startup? Great, like, let me tell you why this company, this moment, right here will never come again and you're gonna get so much equity like let's go <laughs> uh, i don't know which order okay uh i think on the hiring really quick uh, i i think like our bands were like in the high hundreds like to 200 like for a lot of the early people and then appropriate equity so it wasn't like unreasonable like on the cash part it wasn't unreasonable 
I think the AI world has made this a lot harder. Like I was saying to someone, we've had like a, quite a few people actually just receive insane liquid offers where it's like, hey, like I don't blame you. Like, you know, people are making like seven figures. You're like, yeah, like it's like hard to turn that down. Uh, and like you, you can't match them on cash. It's not going to work. So I think it's got to be passion. I think talking to people who are in different career stages, like actually we did try to hire Justin at some point. Uh, I talked to him a long time ago uh, where, you know, like they're at a different stage in their career. Like we had a bunch of people join us who had already done previous startups and they had gotten good enough handcuff packages that they weren't really like money was not really their MO. You know, I think at a certain point people are just like, that's not what's driving them anymore. Um, some of them actually ended up going to their own startups too after we tried to hire them. Um, so I think a lot of those people are motivated differently. Um, I think on the technical, you said what is the technical problem we had to solve? Well, I mean, I think the big one for us is like, we are doing things from like soup to nuts or whatever, like kernel to web stack. And so we made many bad and good decisions along the way where like at first, like we have to write in like three different programming languages, which made our life like a nightmare uh, because it's like we have Python interrupting with C++ and there's CUDA and we also have to support metal and like, and we have like a multi backend, like there's a lot of challenges in there. So I think for us, a lot of it is actually like, how do you get like technical things to flow from like a, a, a React engineer to the person doing kernel engineering and make it apparent to people because those details kind of leak. So like our front end people have had to like learn some stuff about the models and how do you like organize and explain things and build abstractions so that those teams can work together without everyone having to know everything. Uh, Cause I think in the beginning, like everyone we hired was like brilliant. It was like they, they could figure everything out. Uh, but I think as we went to like hundred people, like harmonizing that was like a lot harder. And I think we had some like growing pains where we like deleted some stuff and reorganized and rewrote. And so those were, I think some of the, like the people are, my take is always the hardest part of doing the startup for sure. Like, cause it, your job is to build a human system. Like it's not really about the code anymore. The code is like an artifact on the side. I just add quickly to the hiring thing. We, we, we've had candidates who have asked, you know, non-ironically for 10% equity, you know, or a million dollar salary. And, and you don't even know what to say. Okay. Uh, Anyway, I, I also on the, on, the, on, the, on the technical thing, this isn't exactly a technical thing, but I think it's an interesting question of like, we, we do an open source model, but like one thing that's an interesting thing is you're training a model and if you're gonna contribute an open source, it's not like you can just go hack out a pull request and go send it in, you actually have to go run your own training run. And so how do people contribute an open source to the development of an open model becomes an interesting exercise if there aren't like free GPUs to hand out to people to go do, the, do their own kind of training runs. And so uh, we, we try to find some interesting ways of, of, uh, of dealing with this, uh, of trying to find parts of the model that can be individually trained that are separate, um, that people can do on, on a much smaller budget, uh, or, or do it on free GPU credits that you can get from Google. But I think it's a general problem of, of that, uh, I think Madrona is, is actually, uh, and some other VCs are looking into other ways we can create pools of GPUs that can be kind of created for startup or uh, you know community use to kind of help you know some of these uh, open source communities around models and things you know actually uh, get off the ground. All right, awesome. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us and sharing all of your experiences. Really, really, really enlightening. And uh, uh, they're going to be hanging around here. So thanks for coming out today, tonight, and uh, hanging out with us. Um, for those of you who are starting fresh or starting a new company, uh, just know that Statsig is offering a very generous free tier for all the startups. So go check out statsig.com. Um, in the meantime, uh, I want to thank all of the uh, panelists uh, for uh, being here and spending your Wednesday evening with us. Can we get up?